am Elizabeth Times Booth, and welcome to our Young Prophets Chat. It's so awesome to be here in Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, here at King of Kings Church. We're right in the middle of um, a conference here, Deeper Prophetic Conference, and Jonathan Stidham here, he just preached the house down last night. So you can actually go below here on King of Kings Worship Center and watch the service from last night. So we're going to start with our young prophets here. We have Anna Buchero from Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. We have Josiah Centino from uh, from Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> I got kind of stumped on that. And then Naeem Collins, you guys are from Wilmington, Delaware. I can't say that either. Jonathan Stidham from Lexington, Kentucky. Um, Hakeem, yeah, they're called the Twin Prophets. You guys know them um, from also Wilmington. <laughs> and then Gina, you are from New York. Yeah, what, what's actually... Montclair is that considered New Jer uh, New York, uh, New Jersey? Okay, everything's so close around here. So we want to welcome all of these already. And so please click the share button as you're watching this because we're going to talk about some awesome things. God's raised up a company of young prophets around the world that are going to run together and love each other well. And so what we wanted to start out, let Anna, we'll start with you over there. Um, well, let's talk about. Tell us a little bit just about yourself and what you do. Okay, well, uh, my husband and I are underneath Apostles Tom and Jane and Bishop Bill Hammond at Christian International, and we run the School of the Prophets, um, a 90-day immersion program to train up prophets like these to walk in the fullness of God. We know that God is raising up a company of prophets, like Elizabeth said, in this day and hour. It's multi-generational, and they're empowered to equip the church to bring them into the fullness and bring the bride into the fullness so that when Jesus comes, he has a bride without spot or wrinkle. So what we do, I have two kids. The kids are, we do ministry as a family together. My husband's name is Joe, as I said. And one of the things that we're really passionate about is raising up not only that next generation, but teaching people to do what we do and reproducing that prophetic anointing in other people. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we do. That's who we are. Awesome. Josiah? Yeah, my name is Josiah Centeno, and I am married to my wife, Marlena. We will be married for about 13 years in December. Um, yeah, I went from wanting to kill her to marrying her. Um, and in marriage, there might be moments that are similar like that, but doesn't we don't do it. So, um, so I'm a, a, a church planner, pioneer, uh, running with the prophets, and I really believe in the fivefold kingdom expression of what God does in a local church setting, so local church not limited to the local setting, uh, really believe in raising up people uh, and teams to do the work of the Lord, uh, to spread revival, to spread reformation. Uh, I'm in Camden, New Jersey, the invincible city. Um, God has uh, redeemed that city, he's doing great things in that city. The prophetic declaration over that city, even from uh, the, the media, is Camden rising, and so we've seen God do that in a, in a short amount of time. And uh, just really believing from governmental realm to uh, local church setting and serving the city. Uh, we want to see cities saved, not just people saved, but mm -hmm. in, in, in connection to people getting saved, cities being transformed. Um, and so that's really what we're going after. We're in Camden. We're in Chester, Pennsylvania as well. Uh, and we've, we're raising up missional people uh, to go around the world and spread what God is doing. So that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. I have three children as well, Judea, Jordan. And Jericho. Um, so, yeah, they're all, they got the J's, so <laughs> it's easy for me to remember. Um, but, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Naeem Collins. I'm actually from Wilmington, Delaware. I'm a little bit, probably about 20 minutes south of Philadelphia. Um, you know, my name is Naeem, but I have a twin brother named Hakeem, and so we're pretty much known as the Twin Prophets. Um, pretty much we travel. Um, around the country, and um, and one of my heartbeats for this hour is to run with the prophets. Um, I do do a lot of training, equipping of prophetic ministry with those who have a desire to know about the prophetic. Um, one of the emphasis that I, God has called me to do is to bring such a emphasis to prophetic education because I know that that's one of the things that has been lost in this generation, especially among those who are emerging. And so one of the things that I believe that is key is that as, as these two has also said, is that it's important not just to run as a long ranger, but to run with a company of prophets. And so I believe that it's key that God is raising up a company of prophetic voices in this hour. Oh, wow, I love that. Uh, Jonathan Stidham. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. Not Louisville, Kentucky, but Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> now, that's it. Um, if you're anywhere from Kentucky, you'll understand that. Um, yeah, I just have a, a, a burning desire, like all of all these amazing people, just to raise up people and launch them into their destiny, to see the heart of the Father become the heart of his sons and daughters in the earth. Um, and so, man, just loving Jesus and loving people along the way. Well, I'm Hakeem Collins. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat. It's early. Amen. Um, my heart is um, on the other half of my brother. Amen. And so um, my, my passion and desire is like most of those who have just spoken is really to see people equipped, trained, activated um, into that where God has called them to. And one of my uh, hot spots is really seeing um, the prophetic purified, the streams purified. Um, there's a lot of toxicity in the, in the prophetic streams. So my heart is really to bring uh, clean, cleansing. Um, to detox the prophetic um, and bring it back to its rightful place. And, of course, I can't do it by myself, so it needs a company of prophetic voices. And also, my heart is also to see the father's heart um, turn to the fatherless and the fatherless to the, um, fatherless to the fathers. So really see that coming together, that, that oneness, and just seeing people become all that God has called them and created them to be in the earth. That's so good. I feel so similar to you guys in my calling. All of you relate that. Um, I'm Gina Lamort. I am from Montclair, New Jersey. I do both prophetic ministry and marketplace ministry. I run a fashion company geared towards um, women who are saved out of human trafficking. And my heart as well is to really equip people into their destiny and their divine calling that God has for them. And to really push them out into everything that they were made to be, like the fullness of what God has for them in their life. And to really, um, whether it's inner healing or deliverance or whatever needs to go with that purity, to really just purify people's hearts so that they can walk out everything that God has in a, in a pure and full way. So that's my passion and my heart. No, Gina, why don't you hold on to that? Okay. So when we also when we're talking about it, sometimes people are watching online and saying, like, you guys know your prophet. But, like, how did was there, like, a moment you knew? Like, I knew, for me, I was actually in a service, and the glory came in. We were right in the middle of revival. The glory came in, and I fe- I closed my eyes, and all of a sudden I felt something come, drop down from heaven and come on me like a coat. And I knew it was, like, I didn't really, like, growing up, nobody prophesied to me I would be a prophet, you know. So when that happened, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's a prophetic mantle like came on so that like that was a moment for me and then of course you know then people come and they prophesy and they confirm that calling and of course the gifts start flowing and that so like was there a moment that god maybe you know did that you knew was god your your calling to be a prophet sure well i have a very different experience i felt like i was seeing a lot of visions and having experiences and encounters, and I wasn't really at first understanding what that looked like or what that was, but I know that when I met somebody and I encountered them, I would see their destiny. I would, like, literally see what they were made to do. And so that would happen over and over again, and I was like, I had this burning desire to help people walk that out, and I was like, what is that, Lord? Or I'd see a word over their head, or I'd see, you know, words over their heart that maybe were not so good, but God wanted to erase them. And so that would happen over and over, or I would have dreams, and they would be very long range. Like, stuff would happen years later, and I didn't understand that. And so I really went through a process. For me, it was a process of, like, what's going on, God? What is this about? Who am I? Which I think everybody goes through, you know? And people started to confirm and say, you're a prophet, you're an apostle, you're you know, this, and I'm like, I don't know, okay, you know, like, I wasn't really big on those titles, but I was just like, well, this is my heart for people, and so I feel like over time, and then it was, like, sealed, like, the Lord had, you know, sealed it with different ministries or mentors or people who are higher than me saying, no, this is what you are to walk in, this is what God's called you to, so I just was obedient to that. That's awesome, that's awesome. All right, Hakeem. Yeah, it was kind of similar to, um, her is, um, we were very young. Um, no one was actually saved in our family, in our household. So we didn't have a Christian upbringing at all. Our father was a Muslim, Sunni Muslim. Our, our, our mother was an unbeliever at the time. Thank God she is saved today. Um, but we didn't have a Christian upbringing. And so um, at a very young age, our grandmother actually introduced us um, to the faith, to a Baptist church. 
Um, but prior to that, we lived in a, an environment that was uh, very poor, um, poverty stricken. It was, you know, we lived in the projects, so we didn't have um, an environment or culture that really um, raised us in the Christian faith and to do any of that. And so as a young, you know, me and my brother, as young men, black men, it was really hard in that environment. And so our, our grandmother just wanted to make sure that in the beginning, the foundation was Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, but me and my brother was having prophetic encounters, prophetic uh, dreams, uh, very sovereign moves of God before we was even saved. And that's how I knew it was God because um, it was a seek, it was a drawing. And so our pastor, to just make it real brief, our pastor was a, a, a blind man. We were, um, a, you know, we were in, in a Baptist church and we saw an actual silhouette being behind our pastor. And we both had this open eye vision. We saw this actual, um, excuse me, this actual being. And um, our, we gave our lives to the Lord that wow. day. So when we gave our lives to the Lord from that place, our journey started where we started having um, open eye visions, trances, you name it. We didn't have language at that time. We didn't know what that was. Um, like, like her, we had dreams. We had so many different sovereign uh, call, uh, just an just a, uh, encounter where it just, we were seekers and we wanted more and more and more. It's just mm -hmm. like a, a child. When they have an encounter and they have fun, they won't stop. They won't stop. They won't stop. They won't, it's just this appetite. And that's what happened when we were younger. It was just appetite for more. And then we got filled with the Holy Spirit. And from that place, then we end up getting locked up and all of that good stuff. And then okay. That's a whole other story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> let me ask you, let me ask you this. Who prophesied uh, first? Uh, um, we, you Not creating competition uh, or anything. No. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I can say both of us. And, and re, I'm going to tell you why. We Such both had, a good answer. We had a safe <laughs> answer. <laughs> right. But we had, we would have the same dreams. We would have, we would, it's like twins. Twins will basically That's finish, wild. finish each I other's. i heard of that. You know, twins will finish each other's sentence. And so in the, in the spirit realm, God has a sense of humor. And so I would have a dream, and I would tell my brother, oh, I had a dream tonight. And then what happened is I would tell my brother the dream, and he would finish it or vice versa. And so God would give us the same dream. And so we would have these type of prophetic things wow. as well. So um, we both would just prophesy on the, at the same time. Wow. <laughs> what a good safe answer. Hey, before, we'll give it back to him. So on yours then, like, do you guys ever, like, get words for each other um you know that's the hardest thing um to minister to um family members yeah yeah yeah. Um, because you know them and, and you don't want to tap into a realm of information and information you already know the person but what it does it, it challenges you prophetically to go deeper and just yeah. like this conference is to really go deeper and really hear the father's heart because he knows us more than anyone yeah. And so even um, there's been times where my brother would ask, you know, what is God saying? Or I would ask, what is God saying? And it's funny, we will really tap in and we'd be breaking and crying and it would just be the Father's heart. So wow. it's just, it, it just challenges us and stretches us and it sharpens us. Iron sharpens iron. And then for us to minister to each I mean, we beat each other up all the time. So why not encourage <laughs> each other? So, yeah, we, we, we do minister to each other. I love that. I love that. I'm pretty sure it's not fair that we get in part, but they get in full because there's I, two of them. I know. So I'm just I saying, know. God, you know, I'm I'm like. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> Where, yeah. Where's my yeah. twin at? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I always wanted to have a twin, Me you too. know. <laughs> yeah, I feel cheated now. No, I'm messing. <laughs> so for you, uh, how we are calling I, as a prophet. Okay, I really feel like all of our stories are going to be very similar. Um, mm -hmm. But mine comes, I was actually an atheist. I didn't even believe in God. And so mm -hmm. my real parents had given me up for drugs. They chose drugs over me, and I was adopted by amazing people, but they weren't serving the Lord either. Um, so my sister at eight years old gets radically saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost by a friend inviting her to a camp, comes home, speaking mm -hmm. in tongues and talking about the Holy Ghost. Um, the only time I've only been in church one time prior to that, I was like nine or ten. I was 15 when this happened to my sister. And my brother, we were in a Baptist church, and he dared me, him and his friends, to get on the ceiling fan, and they turned it on. It made two rounds, and it ripped out the ceiling. They kicked <laughs> us out of church. And so <laughs> that's my only experience with the house of God wow. was getting kicked out of the Baptist church for ripping their ceiling fan down. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so uh, at 15 years old, I had a, a radical encounter with the Lord where he came into the room and really dealt with father issues in my heart mm. um, and, and declared that he was my father and that I would go to the nations. Um, so I give my life to Jesus, and I just begin to hear the voice of the Lord. I just didn't know what it was. I would walk by people and just know what, and I would just, mm -hmm. I thought it was like every person who loved Jesus could do that. So I'd walk by and just like tell somebody their whole life, and they would just, oh, and people would be like, this weird, strange, I'm like, you guys can't hear this? Like when you walk yeah, past, yeah, you yeah, can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so um, that was my journey. And then about 10 years ago, 
um, I had an encounter kind of like Samuel where the Lord woke me up three times audibly at night yelling my name. And mm. the first time I thought somebody had walked into my house, I thought it was a burglar. It was so loud that my, my wife was, had fell asleep on the couch with the kids watching a movie. And I rushed in there ready to to. to to beat up, so I was going to fight. We were going to throw hands, you know? <laughs> and everybody was still asleep. Lights were still off. TV had gone to the blue screen because the movie was over. I was like, I'm tripping. And it happened to me again. I was like, okay. You know, and then the third time I was like, here I am, you know? And it was like yeah. God was causing me to step into the place that he had He had called me before I was formed, you know? Wow. So. Yeah. And I think, like, some of you watching on, this may be confirmation for you, encouragement for you that, hey, you know, I do hear the voice of God. God, those experiences were from you when I was younger or those kind of things. And I, if any of you probably, I mean, I don't know your story growing up, but it, there was battles when you were younger over this because the enemy was fighting over your gift. You know, it's like a son has been born and let's let's take care of all the babies, kill all the babies, the saviors in the earth. You know, it's kind of like the enemy just goes after when he knows somebody's marked. And so we may not know it. Our parents may not know it at the time. But, yeah, so Nate. Uh, it's so good that you just uh, mentioned something about um, parents um, having that provision to protect um, God's investment. And um, I can say that for me and my brother because even coming up, our grandparents and our, our mom more particular, she would say she always knew that there was something special on us. And not because we were twins, you know. Um, but because uh, the level of warfare that she had when she was carrying us and even after we were born and then coming um, for our father being Muslim, there's a lot of warfare and tension with just us being the only ones in our family uh, being saved. And I can recall going to church and uh, people would laugh at us because we were the only one because they did not understand you know, that God's hand was on us. But uh, how I knew also that God and my brother just pretty much uh, put it in a nutshell, how God had called us as prophets. Um, I can recall, you know, one time us just seeking God and just going after God. And I remember going in a secret place. And I know when the scripture talks about that, when you go into prayer, shut the door behind you. And, um, and what you pray in secret, God will reward openly. And so I remember being probably around about maybe eight years old, my brother and I going into a closet. We were small. And we actually literally shut the door. And, you know, God honors that childlike faith. And so we took it literally, and we went into a closet. We were able to go into a space with God and just seek him. And, and I can recall having an angelic um, visitation and all of these encounters that my brother had spoke about. But I remember just getting into the scriptures one day, just seeking the Lord. And I was reading out of Jeremiah, and I was reading out of Ezekiel, and reading out of the prophets. And as I was reading the scriptures, it's almost like the scriptures were speaking prophetically to me. Even though my brother and I was at four, 14 years old and we were called out, by a, a woman of God that was a first time encountering a prophet, somebody speaking. And she did call us out and say that God would, would use us as prophets and we would do great things. But again, my brother said, we came from a Baptist church, so we didn't have a language. They didn't teach it. You know, we didn't have uh, any examples around us. But when I got into the scriptures, um, the scriptures really resonated. It really spoke prophetically to me. And I can recall that that Jeremiah and that Ezekiel and that Samuel, when I would read those scriptures, my brother and I, it would just resonate and that's how I knew that surely the Lord had called us to be prophets wow that's awesome yeah um you were right uh, our stories are all going to probably sound really similar and I think that's really encouraging for people who are watching um my story uh Elizabeth you tapped into it a little bit I was tormented as a little kid with horrible nightmares uh, I would see things I'd see shadows I'd see grotesque things, even the things I would imagine would be so frightening to me that I'd, I'd literally be gripped in fear. Um, so I think at a young age, there was the gift or the call, but it was being uh, manipulated and actually hindered or pacified through TV and other things. It was just like it needed a, a place to view, and so uh, it got fed, fed by the world. Um, I remember uh, one of the encounters I had before prophet was son, and I think that is what caused the awareness of prophet to really like be something I never coveted or chased after and so I had an experience I had a, I grew up in the church and I had a lot of anger towards my dad because I felt like church people had more of his attention than me and I'm the youngest boy out of like seven kids and there are people and always he's the pastor, and yeah. he's the pastor yeah. and so um so uh, I remember when I got saved radically saved God you know God's presence came on me 
uh, like a thick blanket, and I literally felt like a brand new person. I didn't know who I was. I was like, who am I now? Um, but I had an encounter where one time uh, my pastor, who's my brother, was preaching, and I felt compelled to go to the front. And as I was there, I was standing with my eyes closed, my hands up, and all of a sudden I saw uh, uh, the figure of a man in shining blue. Um, that's all I can describe it as. And I'm like, how am I seeing behind me what this, like, I, my eyes are closed. How am I seeing this behind me? And so I'm kind of thinking it's just me, but as, as the blue figure of a man comes close to me, it grabs me because my hands are up behind and all my strength just goes. And I fall, but I don't fall, like, hard. I fall like somebody's holding me and, like, literally cradles me down. And every ounce of bitterness I had towards my father, towards anybody, was gone. Like, I completely loved my dad after that moment. I was like, I don't know what changed, but I was, I was embraced as a son. So I literally got awakened to what a son really is. A son is a lover of a father. And so in that moment, I was like radically transformed. And I read the Bible for a year, and I couldn't understand it. I was like, what in the world? Like, I kept doing it because I knew you should read the Bible. Um, and I kept reading, and I got to Jeremiah 1. And it's just like all our callings, right? <laughs> Everybody, turn, Jeremiah one. And I read it, and I, I read from the f from before you were born. <laughs> and uh, to know that before you were born, that you were completely loved and accepted and belonged, and you had something great to do. I always had that feeling like I was called to do something great, but I didn't want to be a leader. I just didn't want it because it was responsibility and. And in that moment where he called me, like, I understood that scripture. Like, that was me. Like, Jeremiah 1.5, that's mine. Like, it's not yours. It's not yours. It's mine. Like, I didn't know it was for other people, but it was completely mine. And at, from that moment on, the word opened up. It came alive. But I could understand the word. I could understand, you know, people's stuff. I would get people's visions and, you know, had dreams about people in my family dying, interceded, and they, you know, God spared their life and things like that. But I didn't understand it till I understood I was a son. Then when I understood I was a son, I got, I got my coat. I got my identity. I got my, my robe. Like, hey, this is what I want you to do, son. And from there, I began to, I went through a seven-year process, actually, of being purified in the prophetic because of all the things I gave myself over to. So he actually completed in the seven-year mark where I was. So that purity piece, man, that's so important for the prophetic. But that's a little bit of, of, of how I was called. Um, by, by the experience of a, a father and son, and then through the, through the reading of the word. You know, I love that. You just touched on something so great, Josiah, because, you know, when we stand before God, he's not going to be like, man, you were just such a great prophet. I'm just so proud of you. You know, that was an assignment on our lives. But when we stand before him, we're gonna, he's going to be like, hey, did you look like me? You know, at the end of it, and I love what you said about a son, their adoration for their father. Because when you adore them and you spend time with them, you actually become like them, right, in their image. And so really, um, if you're a prophetic person or a prophet out there watching, our greatest aim is to end up looking like Jesus. That's why we're servants. That's why we don't necessarily need to put prophet on our business cards or, you know, say la. Say la. No, but you know, because really your gift makes room for you, right? And so, like, we don't need to go. I mean, above all, we're servants. Prophets are servants. So, when you go into place, you're serving everyone. Apostles are servants. So, they go in to serve everyone. So, I think, like, really, when you see yourself as a son doing prophetic ministry, then wherever God's moving, you're moving with him as a son or a daughter. You know, you're moving with him. And I think that was so beautiful how you said that because God had to have you in place. The worst place is to be to think you're all that in a bag of chips and your gift to the prophetic movement. And then God has to strip that because he's like, actually, I really need you to be a son. You know, so I think finding our identity, especially in a fatherless generation, finding our identity is in Christ as a son or daughter, not in him as a prophet. You know, because the gifts, the gifts are like irrevocable, but that's not who we are. The gifts belong to him. The fruit is what makes us end up looking like him. So awesome. Anna? So part of my uh, prophetic journey comes from actually my parents came into the prophetic movement in the late 90s. And, and my dad had been a prophet, you know, from the time that he got saved he got saved in, at the end of the charismatic movement out of the Catholic Church. 
and immediately started hearing God and did not think that he was crazy. You know, he was like, this is in the Bible. This is what God said. Um, you know, they share stories about he heard God's voice tell him to go to Appalachia into the mountains and to be a missionary and to serve the poor there. That's mm. where I was born. Then they came uh, up to Ohio, and, and he continued to hear the voice of the Lord, but was that gift was kind of stifled inside of him for a period of time because he was going through a process, right? So uh, late 90s, he, he went through this, you know, 20-year process. Late 90s, we come into a prophetic church where prophecy flows. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's welcomed into a community, and then we begin to thrive as a family. Up until that point, I, I'm, I'm the oldest of eight kids uh, we are all spirit filled, all hearing the voice of the Lord, but we didn't have the language for what was happening to us. So, you know, we have you know, ma many similar experiences, the nightmares, the encounters with God, the seeing things. My, my sister always would see stuff out the window or uh, my dad was a caretaker for a church property. And so, you know, we had to steward that spiritual ground. So growing up that way, I had I knew that the word of God was true, irrevocably true, and that what it says in black and white, God means. And so the gifts have have always been part of our family culture, um, but they didn't really start kicking in for me until I was a teenager. When I was about, <laughs> well, I, I can think back through so many awesome times when I was talking to the Lord and he answered. The first time I remember being uh, laying on the couch, and I think I was about eight years old, and I was like, maybe, you know, if I pray hard enough, God will speak to me audibly. And I laid on that couch, and I was like, God, speak to me. Being eight years old, the more I say it, the more he'll speak to me. God, speak to me. God, speak to me. And I did not hear the voice of God. And then when I was 12 years old, uh, I felt like the Lord had called me to go on a missions trip to Kenya. And it was for uh, a month long. I was going to go with two friends. And I went before the Lord, and my friends backed out and went before the Lord. And I said, Lord, do you want me to go? And he said, did I not tell you that I would provide for you? And I went. Right. So right away, the voice of the Lord for me was connected to these action points of going and doing. And that's how I heard the voice of the Lord. God, what should I do? Do this. God, what should I say? Do that. And and uh, my sister, she's 13 months younger than me. Really strong prophetic gifting. We have lots of prophetic words about ministering together. But we would go into the uh, this time of intercession as teenagers in prayer and ask the Lord, God, what are you doing? What do you want to do? And he led us when we were 15 and 16, he led us to this passage of scripture where the word of the Lord was being read before the people. And this happens a lot in scripture, but the people fall to repentance and God brings the nation back to him. We took that word to our, our uh, youth pastor at the time. We were like, this is what God wants to do. He wants us to have worship. He wants us to come up and read the word of the Lord and pray through it and do intercession. And our youth pastor was like, I don't think God wants to do that. And uh, it, was, you know, it wasn't three years later that the IHOP movement really came to the forefront. And this 24-7 this prayer and worship and reading of the word had come to the forefront. But I'm sharing that story because this. one, I think every one of us have experienced rejection in our lives. And the rejection of God's word being shared. And, and it's not because of us, you know, we've come and said, or it might be, you know, sometimes our methods are off. But when we've come and brought the voice of the Lord and a religious spirit has despised it or someone who's not, when the ground's not ready, you know, it's, it's hard, it falls to the ground and it doesn't bear fruit. And some of those experiences, and I, I, I really feel like the Lord wants me to share this, these experiences with you guys, is that. All through the, my teenage years, I carried the prophetic in me, but I experienced the process of rejection, and it threatened my identity. It really threatened my identity, and I thought that because I heard God this way, because I was different, that that was a negative thing. And I didn't hide it, but I identified with the negativity that I was experiencing. And teenagers, I'm a youth pastor, right? I know teenagers. I know that stage of life, but... God's voice was, what I want to share is God's voice was constant that whole time to me. I was hearing him the whole time. And, and the environment over me, or even the things I had come into agreement with, did not stop the voice of God to me. Because it was, it was there waiting for the appointed time to break out and to break forth. And God was committed to processing me. 
And I want to say, up until this point, you know, up until my 30s, I've been in a process of God. I've heard him the whole time. I've been a prophet the whole time. But if somebody came up to me and said, you're a prophet, I would have said, just like everybody else, you know, <laughs> like anybody can prophesy. I, it, it doesn't, you know, what does that mean? I'm here for the church. But up until the, you know, God is so faithful for all of us because he's a father and he cares about our quality as sons and daughters. Just like my dad walked into the prophetic movement and opened up something for his whole family. His whole, I mean, you're talking about like 12 people just like that immediately, and, you know, into the kingdom, into the prophetic. Sh and, and what I saw in my family is how the prophetic is modeled in a team of people because everybody could hear God's voice. Everybody was prophetic. So how does it function? How does it operate? We could sit around our breakfast table. Well, well, let's talk drink. about the process a little bit, you know, because I think sometimes in our microwave generation, we all are like, people get saved. They're like, oh, I can prophesy. Oh, I need to be on the biggest platforms ever. That's an identity problem. Like, yeah. we need to be able to say, God, you know what? I'm good with being a, a prophet in Walmart. I'm good with being a prophet wherever you put me, developing me. I think the worst thing, because, you know, I, I think you need to, you know, from the womb to the tomb, you can go without falling, right? But I think when you start building your own kingdom, thinking that you need to build your own prophetic platform, I think that's where people get into problems. Because, and especially if your pastor is like, which, first of all, if you're a prophetic person or prophet, you need to be submitted to a local church. Yeah. Every prophet, to, if I ever hear someone say, well, well, God speaks to me. He's my pastor. You know, like, I'm like, oh, Lord, you will never be on my platform. You know, that's, a, that's an indication that you need some character work in you, which we all need character work in us. I mean, you're talking about the process at 30. I mean, the process goes till you go to be with Jesus. You know, I love um, Billy Graham's wife died uh, when she was always say she's under construction. And then at the end of her life, there was a sign that said construction work over. You know, it's so beautiful. It's like we're we're always and nobody's ever there. You know, we were talking yesterday about, you know, like uh, people in their 80s that still find they're still reading the Bible saying, oh, I've never seen this in the word. And they've been doing it for 60, 70 years. And it's like you don't ever get there. Nobody's that awesome. You know, it's like we need the Holy Spirit. We need each other. We need to embrace and especially prophetic people like to think that you're elite or you're above being part of a company of prophets. That's the scariest place to be like like I'm God's man or woman for the hour. Please listen to me prophesy and please don't talk to me as I go out the door. You know, so so that's a whole different story. But um, so the process, let's talk. Jonathan, let's talk with you about the process, you know, because I mean, none of us are going to have all the answers, but all of us have, you know, parts of our journey that we can share to really encourage people out there that maybe are going up saying, hey, I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, OK, yeah, I'm just going to be really transparent and vulnerable. Because um, the reality is, <clears throat> I still don't feel adequate, you know. And one of the things that marks a true prophet is God won't show you who you are in the spirit. So, like, people will, like, say stuff, and I'm like, me? Like, yeah, really? Right, right, right. And, and I, so I struggle internally really <clears throat> believing where. And, and then most, especially prophets that God isn't called just to be local, but have that he has given platforms. Um, he gives you the great privilege of growing in front of people, which is has been one of the hardest things of my life is falling short, not in sin, but in protocols and bumping my heads and yeah. and saying, man, I wish I did this and I wish I would have done that. You know what it I mean? Keeps and, it's humi it brings you to oh humility, gosh, keeps you there man. low, keeps you low. And, and And so, like, this is all part of. The fun thing called process. And so people are like, oh, man, you get to travel the world. I'm like, I, I honestly never asked for it. And and I was thrusted into it and then left to say, oh, God, now I not only am I um, learning to articulate and learning to grow with you and learning to, to love you well, um, but I get to make all these grand mistakes in front of everybody and then eat it and have to go low and say, hey, you know, um, uh, even in journeying with friends, because we all have things that we've 
been through with people that calls, I just ministered there last night, that calls us to want to look and treat other people and, and box and prophets uh, do well with letting rejection close them off to genuine relationships. So God has to process that in front of the public. And so times where you're, that orphan in you comes out, that rejection in you comes out, and then you're left and you answer to people in certain ways and you do, and then you're like, oh God, man, like I need more freedom in me. You know, like my life, and, and honestly, like I pray this helps somebody because my life has been a journey, still is, of God freeing me publicly. And making me a kind of a parable in front of, like, just freeing me internally public and me going, having these, eat what's called humble pie and saying, man, like, I'm genuinely sorry. And, but praying that God uses it to grow people. Yeah. And especially the process of growing with mothers and fathers, because, you know, there are times where we were talking about this earlier today, you know, all of us probably were run with mothers and fathers. Like there are times maybe they don't understand or they, I think God actually allows them maybe to see some little different. And we talk about it's not, you can't go up to a mother and father and say, well, you just missed it. Like I was right because God, what God will actually allow that is kill you more because we all need to die more. So actually we end up saying, you know, God wants you to do, you know, what's right more than being right. Like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and here's, the, here's the trick, Elizabeth, is learning how to honor and love, even though you're looking at a person that's being processed. So our that's fathers so and mothers good. are still being processed, and we're still being, and it's okay to not view everything the same way yeah. and still know you can walk out covenant. And one of the things God said, I'll turn the fathers to the sons and the sons to the father. He didn't say to perfect fathers or perfect sons yeah, yeah, yeah. or perfect brothers and sisters. And so being able to come into the common denominator of honor, even yeah. though we're looking at one another saying, man, we're still on a journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I believe that we've got to get to the place where we can say, man, we may not agree with everything, but we honor one another. Yeah, absolutely. And we're being processed, absolutely. and it's okay. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we sell, you know, the saying, we celebrate who who we are, not who we're not, who they're not. Because then we go, you're from a different generation. We try to find all these things just to justify our behavior sometimes. And so I think when it, anything with covenant, anything with true covenant will be under attack. And so we have to realize, I remember my spiritual mom, Jane Hammond, she, I was interviewing her and she turned to me and it was, it was such a God moment and a mark in my life. She turned to me and she said, Elizabeth, we, we, the generations have to learn how to fight for each other. So like, as if you're, if you're being mentored, it's not just me trying to fight for my double hair, uh, like my double portion, but they have to realize there's going to be war for for any kind of inheritance. And so when, when both generations, Elijah and Elisha, Elisha and Elijah can look at each other and say, hey, you're worth fighting for. You're worth fighting for. Can you imagine a dad or a mom fighting for the son or daughter? That's one of the most beautiful things as a son or daughter. You know, as a daughter, for me, like to think that like a spiritual parent would fight for me. Like, isn't that beautiful for all of us to know that they would say, uh, this far, devil, and no more. Like, I'm protecting my son or daughter. So, um, uh, Hakeem, let's let's talk about this. Uh, what do you feel like God's saying? Um, like, during this time, whether it's your New Jersey, this conference is focused on, deeper conference, is focused on the Northeast. We feel like there's some rumbling in the earth yeah. uh, to here. And so, what do you feel like God's saying that? You can share some for the nations. What do you feel? Yeah. Yeah, well, because um, we're seated <clears throat> in this region, um, God would, or if, if you're a prophet, God will give you something for your region. Um, even though we have um, another, you know, greater reach and um, influence, but God will give you an, uh, a word of the Lord for your region. So um, I'm just going to prophesy. I heard the Spirit of the Lord say that this is going to be really a season in this northeast region. He said that I am resetting you. In this hour, he said, the rumbling and the shaking is of me. And the Spirit of the Lord says, Northeast, hear the word of the Lord. This is a time of awakening. He said that I am purging, I am cleansing, I am causing. Even there is a clarion call to the prophetic, the, those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in this hour. He said that I am reaching even uh, New York City. And for New York City, I am cleansing you and I am awakening you. For you shall be an engine for the East Coast, says the Spirit of God. 
And he says, I'm removing the Babylon. I'm removing the Egyptian uh, uh, status off of you. And he said, I'm bringing you into a place where you will shine. And there will be an Isaiah 60 uh, mandate on your life that you will arise and shine. The light has come and the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you. And the Spirit of the Lord says, no, in this northeast, going down to Pennsylvania, to uh, New Jersey, to Delaware. God says, even all the way up to Connecticut, the New England Territory, God is going to begin to cause there to be an alignment. There is an apostolic alignment that is taking place, and I am bringing streams together. For he said, I am breaking the dis the discord, the dissension, the division, the competition, and I am washing, cleansing. And I am in this season, says the Lord, it's coming after a remnant in this hour that will do great exploits and will have the word of the Lord in their mouth for their region, for their community, for their city, says the Spirit of God. And I am reaching out to a millennial generation, for they have marked you and said that you're rebellious, but I am raising up, says the Spirit of God, revolutionists in this hour that will begin to shake and change the seven spheres and domains in their territory. So get ready, for I am coming, and there is a sign in the heavens that I will do this, says the Lord, this year. And even in this hour, the Lord says, know that I have not forsaken you, and I have not forgotten you, says the Spirit of God. For this is the hour where I am bringing the generation together, the fathers and the mothers, and the mothers and the fathers, and the sons and the daughters. This is the hour there is going to be a cross-pollinization. This will no longer be a season that you would say, no, we will not run together. This will no be longer be a season of excuses. But the Spirit of the Lord says, no, that my eye has come upon you, that I have seen your pain, I've heard your cry, and the intercession has come forth before me, says the Spirit of God. But this region shall be a marker. This region shall be equipped. This region shall be educated. This region shall know the, the Lord, and they will begin to do greater things in this hour. For signs and wonders will come out of this region, and there will be even the media. The media says the Spirit of God on the East Coast as well. The media will even say that God is no more, or there is other things, but God says not so. For I am awakening this Northeast region, and it will be a beacon of light and a beacon of hope, and it shall be a, oh my God, the Spirit of the Lord said, this is a game changer, for I am doing something even in the year 2020. Get ready, for I am in line in your vision. 2020, this is an hour where I will release a new voice and a new sound and a people that will come together with the word of the Lord in this region, says the Spirit of God. And I even hear the Lord say to you, old Northeast, as God said, get ready because there is a changing of the guards. And I'm even causing you to arise up, says the Lord, in this season. For the Lord declares over you, old Northeast, that uh, Isaiah 65 and 8. For the Lord says that new wine is found in the cluster. And the Lord says that you shall run together with the company, says the Lord. And the Lord says, Northeast, you will not run alone. For the Lord said, I have not forsaken you. For even eyes have been upon the south. There has been eyes upon the even the Midwest. There's eyes even upon even the west, says the Lord. But the Lord says, my eyes has also been towards you, and you will not be an orphan region, says the Lord. But the Lord says, but I will send fathers to you, O northeast, and hear ye the word of the Lord. For the Lord says, they will not throw away you. But the Lord says, but there is good grape, there is good wine that is in you, says the Lord, and I will not destroy. But the Lord says, but I will raise up, for there is a company, and there is emergence, says the Lord, that is coming out of the northeast. There's prophets that are in caves, but I'm even calling them out of the graves. And for some has tried to stop you and stop your momentum and said this region is not prophetic. But I heard the Lord says, get ready, O Northeast. But I'm calling them out of Philadelphia. I'm calling them out of Pennsylvania. I'm calling them out of New Jersey. I'm calling them out of New York. And the Lord says that you shall arise and be a great force in the earth. And I will raise up prophetic companies of prophets that will shake the nation, says the Spirit of Grace. agree. So um, I just feel to really speak to New Jersey specifically and that the Lord has redemption on the garden state, yeah. that we are the garden state and that he wants to revive his garden yeah. and bring it back to life. And the corruption that we have seen with our earthly eyes is not how we're supposed to be looking, but we are supposed to be seeing New Jersey in the spirit. And it is the garden state. That's the correct name for the state. And the Lord wants to blossom and bring fire. He wants to bring fire through his people here that there has been people hidden 
and that he is sprouting up all of these who, who've been hidden underground. And I even see the wells opening up that people have been praying for for years and years and years that these wells are opening and that that wave of glory that he had said would come, the wave of fire that he said would come through New Jersey, through the coastline even, that there will be such a rising of people and a spirit that they won't be stagnant anymore. There will be no more stagnation in the state of New Jersey, that people will wake up in the spirit and finally use their voice without fear to proclaim what God has been saying to them for years and years, and the prophets will stand up and will agree. Because everything that happens in New Jersey, it happens here first. We are the port to the nations. That port is in New Jersey. All of those nations come through New Jersey, not through New York City, through New Jersey. That's the entrance to this country. So what happens here in New Jersey will be a picture of the country. And I want to add to what she said. The Spirit of God even just spoke to me. She hit it about the ports. He said that I'm going to even, even expose even the corruption in the ports. And he said that I am doing something even in the naval system, even in the Navy. God is going to begin to cause things to begin to transpire, even with the military, the Navy, the Navy, even in the ports. You will hear in the days to come concerning the ports. You will hear uh, even things being exposed in the ports, even in New Jersey, in Philadelphia, in Camden, New Jersey, uh, and even in Wilmington, Delaware, even in the ports in the region, I'm telling you, there's going to be a purification for he is sending the prophets to put the salt in the water and they will begin to purify the prophetic stream. We're, we're coming with salt. We're coming to purify the streams and the wells, for there is a cleansing that is coming. There is a shifting that is coming and there will be a new, even she said New, uh, new Jersey, but God says New Jerusalem. There is a heavenly deposit. There is a New Jerusalem. There is an awakening is coming. So get ready, Northeast. This is your time to be responsible. This is your time to respond. This is your time to wake up. This is your time to no longer stay hidden. But God is bringing you from obscurity and bring you to divine visibility, says the Spirit of God. Yeah, I was even taken in a vision as Dr. Hakeem was prophesying, and I was taken to the years where the tea was kicked over because of the taxation of the people. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and he said that the people of God, his sons and daughters, are rising up in the realm of the Spirit, and they're tired of being taxed by religious polities. They're tired of being taxed by governmental uh, uh, laws and regulations that are binding their voice and binding their hands. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, said, I'm uncuffing the hands of the church and I am unmuzzling the mouth of the people and in the days that come you will see an overturning you will see a kicking over of the tea you will see the kicking over of the tea and you will come back in time and renew in this region what was started hundreds of years ago through the taxation of a people and the taxation will come up and the Egyptian spirit will lift off of this region that territorial spirit will lift off of this region you will see a rise even in the government as what they said that this state will never change. This state will always be the same. But you will see a rise in the people. You will see a changing of the color and the changing of a guard in this region in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in a place where you've come in an agreement with murder, you shall even see that overturned in the realm of the spirit. For I see people even in the days to come marching down the streets declaring freedom, declaring the right of life, declaring that babies matter, declaring that marriage matters. And so I decree and declare this over this region, this state, and this, this northeast territory in the name of Jesus. In fact, I saw an arm reach through the northeast. You are the arm of America. God has called you to be the right arm of America, the strong arm, the justice arm in the name of Jesus. All right, I, I, I have two things. One is that God's going to uh, purify the waterways, and he's going to address the issue of innocent bloodshed. But two, I want to call right now the apostolic fathers in the spirit to awaken. Those apostolic fathers and mothers that have just been doing business as usual, I speak to you in the spirit, and I call you out of hiding and out of obscurity. Those who have put their hand to the plow, and they're ju it's just drudgery. It's just trudging through the mud. Right now, I decree and declare glory over your life, and that your harvest will be on the horizon. Your harvest is coming. I decree it now. The apostolic seed that has been planted in New Jersey will come to fruition and will begin to put the spirit in order. 
I decree order over New Jersey in the spirit realm that the fathers will arise, the mothers will arise, and they will begin to decree, and it will be so. They will decree over go government. They will decree over every system ruling the nation, ruling the city, ruling the state, and they will set things in apostolic ecclesiastical order in the name of Jesus. Yeah, pray over the waterways. <laughs> so I noticed when I was uh, flying in today, these canals um, that were just polluted, they're just brown, disgusting. And I know that it's a picture in the spirit as well. So right now, Father, I, I'm going to come before you, God, and I'm going to remit the sin of innocent bloodshed over this land. God, I ask that you would come and that you would wash New Jersey in your blood, that your blood would speak a higher word than the blood of aborted babies, God, dumped into the sewers. God, I ask you right now, Father, for this state, your blood speaks a better word, God. It washes away the impurity. It is through your blood that we come to the throne by grace, through faith. And I bring you this land. And I bring you these water rays. And I decree that New Jersey's water quality will change. And it will increase in water quality. God, that springs of living water will gush forth from this state. That the waterways would be purified because <laughs> I just see the churches washing the feet of the people, Amen. and God restoring the waterways because of the service of the churches to the state, and I decree that in Jesus' name. Lord, we decree a purification of the waterways. I see purity, purity, purity. Lord, we speak purity. Lord, move out. Move out corruption, God. Move out impurities, Lord. We speak, we decree purification over the waterways in the name of Jesus. And I heard the Lord said, speak tenderly to New Jersey. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And so, Father, we speak the tenderness of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, the tenderness of the Spirit. God, we speak to the deep-rooted issues in the land of bloodshed of rebellion, of negligence, and we speak tenderly. Let your tenderness divorce every ungodly demon, mindset, and heart pattern. God, we speak tenderly to leaders and people. We speak to their spirits, come alive. And come into the heart of Jesus. All you who are weary and weighed down by the world's injustice and enslavement. You are invited to the table to drink for free, to eat for free, to belong because of the blood the priceless and matchless blood. The blood is free, but it costs everything. And so we speak from the tenderness of the blood of Jesus Christ. We speak over the land. We speak to the root systems under the ground, under the ground that have touched and agreed with powers and principalities in the air. And we declare that our God reigns. Our God reigns. Let God arise. And every enemy be scattered. Every enemy under the ground or in the air. Jesus, make it a footstool. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We declare that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth, cover New Jersey, cover the region as waters cover the sea. As you purify the waters, let the land be cleansed. Let the spiritual landscape and skyscape be transformed by the blood and by the spirit. And we speak tenderly. We speak tenderly to each other. We speak tenderly to apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists. We speak tenderly to the fivefold. We speak tenderly to the saints of God most high. We speak tenderly to wounded churches and regions. We speak tenderly. And I hear the Lord saying this to us, I've made you a covenant for the peoples, a light to the nations, 
Do not be surprised that I take you to foreign places and insecure places to become security. Your covenant with me will be the missing link that creates connection again. That just like my son became a bridge, you'll be a bridge to nations and generations. And the latter day glory, even in your youth, even in the immaturity of this movement, there will be season for the season. So God, we thank you. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to be a part. Thank you for speaking tenderly to us so that we could speak tenderly through prophetic decree. In Jesus' name. Yeah, that's so beautiful. You know, when I came came in, sometimes I come in the area, I can put my feet on the ground and feel what's going on. And I feel like there's such a reformation anointing in the Northeast. And so I feel like here's what, I mean, you guys understand this. We're talking to you online. Um, what happens is if sin's in the ground, it affects the people, right? And if righteousness is in the ground, it affects the people. So What's happening is there's such a, like, reformation anointing that's in the northeast, in the ground, but the enemy has taken the voices of people, that reformation anointing, and what he's actually doing is changing laws. There was a law that was changed here in New Jersey just this week about um, teaching uh, LGBT here in the schools there because the reformation anointing has been, it's been pushed towards the enemy. And so I want to decree as a company of prophets, I want to decree righteous reformation leaders. We decree in the name of Jesus, the righteous reformers, righteous reformation leaders would arise. And Lord, where the enemy has come in with lies to tort them to use their reformation gift for evil, Lord, we call them back in. We call them and we decree even today, it'd be a shift that that, that those lying spirits that had gotten in then, it would come, actually the righteousness would come back in. And Lord, we call them in right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we speak a shift even today in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you and we call them forth. We call them forth righteous reformers. I decree righteous reformers. I decree righteous reformers in the Northeast in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, 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 wow. The Lord's here, guys. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's the only way to do stuff is when he comes, right? We just flow with him. Wow, I'm an easy target, so, you know, I always tell people if I fall out, just keep going. So let's talk about, let's talk about prophets and apostles. I think in this season, everyone's noticing because there are a company of prophets and that. So we hear a word, I feel like revival represents like the prophets where we're like, we need that bow, you know, like prophets come in as the pow right? And then you need sustainable things of the reformer. The reformer comes to build, the, take the prophetic word that was given, takes that revival and like puts it in the earth, right? So, so revival's the prophet, reformation's the apostle, and God's calling both. Yeah. I grew up in revival. We just didn't need revival. We need reformation. We were awakened. It was a pow to everybody's soul and saying, we need God. We're so hungry for God. So what do you do then? You occupy till he comes, right? So then you come in and you need to work with the apostle to help you build what you just saw. So let's talk about how, we'll start with you, Anna. How important is it for the prophets to make sure they're running with apostles? Because I, I can I be honest with you? Sometimes prophets don't want to listen to apostles. And sometimes apostles don't want to listen to prophets. But like he said, there's got to be some kind of honor and love and unity that we get ahead saying, you know what? We're different, but we need each other. And we're going to put down our differences, but actually say, hey, like, how do we do this together? Because I'm telling you to build what I'm doing. Like, I need apostles and prophets in my life. So, Anna? So, in order to build something that lasts you need all fivefold, right? Yeah. But particularly apostles and prophets are the foundation stones that everything else is built on. So, of course, the enemy is going to target that alignment, right? So not only are we dealing with massive personality differences in apostles and prophets and different giftings, we're also dealing with targeted warfare at that relationship in the earth. So what I've seen a lot is it's 
um, and I love this upcoming generation. I'm, we're, we are millennials, but there's a generation underneath us that was born into the apostolic move. They are pre-wired for divine order, and they will have nothing else. I mean, they're really like no-nonsense people. Um, and I see this because I'm a youth pastor, so they want line upon line, precept on pre upon precept, but they tend to have a major religious spirit. So, right? I'm just saying it, right? <laughs> if it's not their way, then it's no way, right? Now, the prophetic has the ability to go, to glide and slide, to go and flow with whatever God is doing. He always tells us what's happening, right? And so we have pre-wired in us an ability and a flexibility to go with that flow. We don't always need to know the detailed whys. We can just go out in faith and do what he says. Now, of course, that's a, you know, I'm, I'm categorizing people. There's people all in that spectrum. There's also people who carry the apostle and the prophet together, right? And, and that is a uh, very interesting way to live. So with, <laughs> I mean, to say the least, because you have a desire for order, but you have to know the order of heaven. And that's what I want to hit on with the apostolic. The apostle doesn't, a true apostle does not just look for things to be in order in an organization or in a culture, but they look for the divine order of God. And that is why they need prophets. It is very hard to do the work and also be in a place of constant listening. You can do it, but you have got to partner with somebody, especially regionally, who is hearing the voice of God for that area so that then you as an apostle can go and network and begin to lay the foundation stones for those things to happen. And we have to value those gifts in each other and we have to find somebody to help us. An apostle will always feel like a prophet is messing with their plans. A prophet will always feel, not. I mean, I'm ta not talking about redeem redeemed gifts. I'm talking about in the process, prophets will feel restricted a lot of times by apostles. But here's what apostles give to the pro prophets. They give stability, they give acceptance, and they give fatherhood, right? Fatherhood and motherhood. Here's what prophets give to apostles. Vision, energy, and life. Apostles without prophets are dead tombs because they're just a structure. And they, they can be very manipulative too, right? We're talking about unredeemed things. They can, they can, they're about, you know, organizing people, putting them in order to accomplish something. If we don't see the value of, of covenant unity in these gifts, we are missing out on the aspects of God the Father. Yeah. We're, we're preaching a gospel that doesn't have legs. We have got to, as prophets, we have got to partner with apostles. If we really believe what we say we believe, about God changing something or God moving or revival being a lifestyle, then we're going we're gonna to work with the local church. <laughs> we're going to work with those pastors. We're going to work with the apostles of the city and the fathers of the city. When you begin to build an organization, and I, I have business experience, so I approach this like an organization. God is in the business of building something. He's building a kingdom. And, and, to reject any part of the body is an injustice to his plan. It's, it's an insult to the kingdom. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm speaking very plainly because I work, I'm a apostolic and prophetic. Can you tell? So I'm very passionate about this, right? The sister that I mentioned before, she's very, very prophetic. Prophet is number one. Apostolic is second. So when, you know, and working with prophets and training prophets, right, in that apostolic gift, I'm looking for stability, and I'm providing them stability, right? Well, let Jonathan, let, you're, you're an apostle and a prophet, and you are business, I mean, you're just multi, multi, multi-fold. Um, let's talk about this, uh, apostles and prophets needing each other, honoring each other. Like, can you kind of unfold that a little bit? For maybe if um, yeah. people are watching online, sure. they don't understand the, how they work together. Yeah, and I, I, was, I was just telling Dr. Hakeem, I said, you know, this is really a Samuel generation. Because Samuel was both a prophet and an apostle. Yeah. He was a seer and a builder. Yeah. And uh, if you ever want to enter conflict, be an apostle prophet or a prophet <laughs> apostle. Like, because now you're like, i got to get a little prayer, but i got to build something. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I really yeah, feel yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. truly all of our gift oh, mix. Yeah. And so there's this inner war. Um, and the hardest thing in that moment is not to become your own prophet. 
because I can hear God. I can see. You know what I mean? And so the one thing I have to do when it pertains, so, so Paul was a, both a prophet and an apostle as well. He was counted among the prophets and teachers. And in Acts 15, he was anointed as an apostle. So he goes on to say, I'm an apostle over what I govern. But I'm a prophet over here. Like, so he would travel as a prophet, but he would govern as an apostle over the works he planted. And so, so what I do is I establish prophets around me over the works that I oversee. So I can be a prophet to the nation. But as the apostolic rises in me, I've learned to, to um, bring in other prophets who can hear and see, who can give me the word of the Lord while I'm building here. And while I'm hearing for over here. Yeah, yeah. So I've had to learn how to separate because it's like there's this, you know, that, that, that inner conflict. So that's been kind of my journey with it. I'm not, I haven't arrived in any, but, but I've, I've learned to try to, to separate the hats and say, um, I was actually telling Josiah in the car um, when the Lord spoke to me, when I was so frustrated in my local church. Um, because as a prophet of God, they, I've, I've always, like two years ago, every day for like seven months, I came home and quit. Like, I was like, I quit. These people won't, they're, ah, you know? And, and the Lord spoke something that, like, freed me. He said, John, your home church doesn't need a prophet. They need a pastor. Open the Bible and teach them. Yeah. Wow. And I said, what do you mean they don't need a prophet? I'm a prophet. Now, uh, but I've, I've come to realize because of certain elements, like familiarity, um, because of their need to, for love, that when I come to my home church, I kind of have to turn the hat over and say, let me teach you. And I'm still being a prophet. I'm just using the word to prophesy yeah. rather than just always the rhema to prophesy. Um, and so I've learned the dichotomy. I'm trying to learn, still learning the dichotomy of switching the hats and learning how to navigate with Holy Spirit in the territory you are. Yeah, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. We actually have to wrap up a little bit here. So um, let's kind of start with Gina. How can people get in touch with you, like whether it's social media or how can people get in touch with you they're watching? Sure, social media is Gina Lamort. That's it, Gina Lamort. On both on, Instagram uh, on and Instagram, Facebook? Yeah, on Instagram, on Facebook, or my website, GinaLamort.com. Awesome. It's so good having you. Oh, and Hakeem Collins, and then my website is HakeemCollinsMinistry.com. Is that on Instagram and Hakeem Facebook? Collins on through all the social Oh, he's handles. all of them. Hakeem Collins. Snapchat. Yeah. You'll see, no, you'll I'm just see my handsome <laughs> picture. That, you, you'll know it's me. <laughs> just look for the jacket. Um, <laughs> Jonathan Stidham, JSGlobal.org. So, and it's Jonathan, J-O-H-N. J-O-H-N. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. Uh, Naeem Collins. I know people mess my first name up. It's N A. I am. All right, Collins, uh, ministries.com, that's where you will find me on my website. And then also through all of the social media handles, you could just put my name in and it should come up. Yeah, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Josiah Centeno. Um, and through our website, which is uh, the local church, it's uh, itlcamden.com. If you want to check in the out. Light, in the Light yeah, Camden. Yeah, In the Light Camden. In the ITL. Um, ITL to keep it short. So in the Light Camden.com. Uh, so you can see what God is doing in Camden, New Jersey. So Anna Buchero, and you can get a hold of me at schooloftheprophets.us or you can text 345 345 profit. Uh, text profit to 345 345. And I'll get right back to you. Right? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Prophetically. No. Okay. <laughs> hey, Anna, let's talk real quick before we end here. Um, you guys are doing a 90-day immersion. immersion yes. at. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. If so, people are interested. So this is what we do. We train prophets and prophetic people to go forth with the word of the Lord. So we've taken our school. We were previously a degree program. We've taken that information and we've condensed it into a 90-day intensive. You're in classes. You're doing hands-on. We're listening to the word of the Lord through you. We're working with you. We're mentoring you. We're building you up, and then we're sending you out. So I want to invite you, you know, come well, down. You learn about somebody. character. You learn oh, about yeah. your gifting, all right. of that. So name Absolutely. some of the teachers that they all Yeah, so attend. Apostles Tom and Jane, um, always, they're a part of our school. They're the builders of our school. Um, Bishop Hammond's going to be with us. He's been traveling around the nation doing mentoring days, and this is a little secret for everybody. You're going to get a mentoring day as part of that. It's actually very expensive to go to one, but he's going to come and he's going to sit with yeah, us and, and share Bill with Hammond us. Yeah, and Bill is known as the uh, father of the modern day prophetic movement. So. He is, and he's the father because he set it in. He set he sets things in order. So we're talking yeah. about the character. We're talking about prophetic ethics. Yeah, we're talking about the basics of the Nabi prophet, that flow, the seer prophet, the watchman prophet. We're mm -hmm. talking about. Um, 
a prophet in the local body and how that functions, how to pa partner with pastors, how to partner with apostles. Yeah. But uh, more, I, I love all of that stuff. That's a foundational teaching, but we're going to get people prophesying and activated yeah, yeah. every There's single There's actually day. on the campus there, it's so great to be there because you yeah. actually, that environment that's set oh, man, in order there, awesome. you, it actually helps you while you're doing that. And yeah. so, you know what? Prophets and prophetic people need training. Yes. They need training. People just yeah. say, well, why can't they just prophesy? I mean, there's schools of evangelism. Right. Why can't you just go, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all these. And so it's so neat to have such a healthy, you know, guys, yeah. we've seen unhealthy. Yeah. We want to see healthy prophets raised up. And right. it doesn't matter what age or stage you're at. Like, go and register. What's the website again? It's schooloftheprophets.us. And one of the things, you know, we feel it's very important that you come on location. Yeah. That's why we condense it down There's into no 90 online days. There's no online. It's hands-on. I mean, you're going to get, I mean, hands are going to get laid you know, on yeah. you. And if you, and if you write Anna today, she will send you a prophetic I, word. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Too much pressure. But, but yeah, there's this, that. there's this environment. I mean, I, people have come to Vision Church to CI totally not prophesying ever before in their life. Within 24 hours, we have them giving uh, Isn't there like personal 100% prophetic words. Like it is 100% success rate. Yeah. And, and we've had people come that are not even baptized in the Holy Spirit. We get them baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they're like, prophesy. And yeah. because of the anointing on the house, they do it. And they yeah. can. And there's an environment of love and yeah. acceptance to raise those prophetic children and to raise up those prophets with affirmation, with love, and with wisdom. <laughs> awesome. So CI School of the Prophets. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. These amazing prophets. If you are in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, however you can get here by bicycle, by train, planes, scooters, um, however you can get here, get here. There's registration at the door for a deeper conference. Apostle Jane Hammond is in the house tonight. And so we are going to have amazing, these guys will be here tonight. We'll be prophesying to people tonight. So we're only prophesying to people that are actually in the conference. So um, we're not going to do online. So if you can and you're in the area, please come and register and be part of tonight. And thank you so much for joining us.